السلام عليكم this is Dr. Mariam Al-Abdullah, a professor in orthodontics at the University of Jordan and senior orthodontic consultant at the Jordan University Hospital. And this is our third lecture on cephalometry. And just to remind you with our reference, chapter six from Laura Mitchell, an introduction to orthodontics. And just to remind you with the standardized settings to take a cephalogram and the result uh, as you can see the proper uh, radiographs uh, that you should be having at the end of this process. And then analyzing the uh, radiograph following the uh, these steps, tracing of soft tissues and bony outlines, and then identification of cephalometric landmarks. And then you actually uh, start to connect these points to form uh, geometric constructions, lines, planes, uh, angles, um, major angles, major lines, sig ratios, etc. Okay, so these are the main cephalometric points, planes and lines. And then after that, after you get your measurements, you need to compare them with the normal values and the standard deviation. And we talked about uh, the meaning of these numbers in terms of skeletal pattern, uh, in terms of uh, anterior posterior skeletal pattern, vertical skeletal pattern, also incisors position. Uh, and now we come to an important uh, uh, topic, which is assessing growth and treatment changes. So uh, this this could only be done if you have more than one cephalogram. So for example, then one that you take at the baseline or before treatment and another one uh, one year after in order to check growth or near end of an active orthodontic treatment in order to check progress of treatment and dental changes or skeletal changes. Um, or after orthognathic surgery, for example, to check the skeletal changes etc. So you need to have at least two cephalograms in order to compare and uh, get some findings related to uh, growth changes or treatment changes, dental or skeletal. Now, in order to do so, we can use certain uh, structures as a reference, as a, uh, as a specific cephalometric uh, landmarks in order to superimpose on as our reference to compare the rest of the structures to. And these are th three main structures, the cranial base, and we superimpose different radiographs on the cranial base in order to look at the overall changes, usually in the uh, skeletal pattern. We can superimpose on the maxilla in order to look at the changes within the maxilla in terms of the incisors, the molars, in the anterior posterior and, and in the vertical dimensions. We can superimpose on a certain stable structures in the mandible in order to look at changes of, of the uh, lower incisors and lower molars position, again, in the anterior posterior and in the vertical dimensions. And having, having said that, your structural method is so far the best method to, to be used for superimposition. And it is a superimposition method based on the anatomical structures known to be most stable. Not perfectly stable, but compared to other structures, they are considered stable. And uh, we will talk about different structures that we use for the superimposition. So in case of the cranial base, we can use the decoster's line, which is anatomical landmarks of the cranial base, or we can use the S in line on the S, on the S point, and this is more commonly used. So, for example, the solid black line is the pre-treatment, and the dotted line or the dashed line is the near end of treatment radiograph. So we have both tracings we, together. We superimpose them on the S in line, superimposed on the S. So these two on this line but it is superimposed on the S line. And then we look at the changes, the overall changes. So if we look here, we will find that the maxilla uh, did grow a little more vertically 
it, we can see that it moved backward, but actually it's not the maxilla that moved backward. What happened is that the upper incisors uh, were changed in position with the orthodont with the active orthodontic treatment, and what happened around it is remodeling of bone. In the mandible, you can see that we have an overall downward forward growth of the mandible. Changes in the soft tissues as a result of growth and as a result of changes in the upper and lower incisors position. All right, so this is the overall uh, assessment of changes when we superimpose on the cranial base, SN on the S point. Now, if we look at the maxilla, there are three ways to superimpose uh, the, uh, the, the the maxilla as a stable structure. It's mainly the anterior nasal spine, the posterior nasal spine, which is the maxillary plane, and it's on the posterior nasal spine. So these two well, these two uh, points, and it's mainly we uh, stabilize the posterior nasal spine and we keep the line the, the maxillary plane as it is, and then we superimpose the pre-treatment with the uh, near end of treatment uh, cephalogram. And if we do so, as you can see here, we will see that the upper incisors was retroclined and was bodily moved both. And we can see that the molar was slightly, slightly um, intruded and a little bit mesialized, minimal mesial movement. Okay, so it's mainly movement of the maxilla in, in maxillary incisors if we look at the dental changes in the maxilla. Another method is to look at the contour of the lower border of the palate. It's considered a relatively stable structure. A third method is to use the anterior surface of the zygomatic process of the maxilla, and this is based on the Yorks and Scalers research in the 1979. But the more, most commonly, we use the maxillary plane on the posterior nasal spine. For the mandible, there are a number of structures that are considered stable, and they are called the York's stable structures of the mandible. The first is the inner surface of the cortical bone of the inferior border of the symphysis. Exactly here. Okay. So this is the symphysis, and this is the innermost surface of the cortical bone of the inferior border of the symphysis. The anterior contour of the chin can really change, remodel, or uh, uh, you know, modify during growth. So this is considered a good stable structure. Anterior, the sorry, the outline of the inferior dental canal. The outline of the inferior dental canal is also a stable structure. The crypt of the developing third molar, um, as long as the roots hasn't started to develop. If the root is starting to develop, the bifurcation area, etc., then the crypt of the developing third, uh, third molar is not reliable anymore because it will change, it will start to erupt. But as long as it's it is still developing, there is no root formation, it is considered relatively a stable structure. Right, oh, so, sorry. So let's look here. So we have, um, again, a solid line represent the pre-treatment and a dashed line represent after treatment, oh, sorry, near end of treatment because it's not justified to take a radiograph after treatment. Uh, what benefit can we have uh, from a radiograph after treatment? We rarely do this, only in specific cases where we're worried about stability or if we want to compare the results with later on as we go with uh, follow up uh, the case later on. Usually we take it near end of treatment as the appliance is still uh, bonded on the teeth because as we take the results, we can change. We, we can make a change as uh, based on the results. So here, for example, what happened is that we stabilized the mandible and we looked at the incisors. So the inside, the lower incisors were intruded and the molars were extruded and mesialized during treatment. So these are the changes that occurred during treatment for the lower incisors and molars. Again, uh, you can see that the, uh, the black line is the pre-treatment and the uh, blue line is near end of treatment. Um, uh, as you can see, this is the overall superimposition uh, on the SN line, uh, stabilized on the S point. And when we look at the overall changes, we will find that the maxilla did grow downward um, 
and the mandible downward and forward. And if we look at the maxilla uh, by itself, we will find that, uh, of course, superimposed on the anterior nasal spine, posterior nasal spine, uh, fixed on the posterior nasal spine, we will find that the upper incisors were uh, proclined and intruded, and the molars were extruded and a little bit mesialized. Looking at the mandible, they actually use the mandibular plane, the uh, minton and the gonion, but if you look also, the inner uh, most uh, contour of the synthesis was also used. Um, uh, not perfect uh, superimposition of the uh, feeder alveolar canal and the developing follicle of the wisdom, but this is an acceptable superimposition. It's not going to be perfect. So what happened to the lower incisors? It was slightly proclined. The molars definitely extruded and mesialized. Okay. So these are the overall changes that happened uh, that, and, and could be assessed using cephalogram at two different points. Um, now, what are the limitations of using a cephalogram? Firstly, as we know, it's a radiograph that cannot be taken that frequently because of the risk of radiation exposure. Uh, unlike the study models, unlike photos, we can take them as frequently as necessary, but radiographs, we should be very careful, as low as reasonably achievable uh, guidelines should be followed. Uh, the other limitation is that this the process of taking the radiograph and analyzing the radiograph and writing reports usually is a time consuming process. Finally, we also have this is not a perfect uh, process. We usually have uh, different sources of errors, uh, projection errors, identification errors and measurements errors. Uh, projection errors is usually related to the fact that this is a radiograph uh, that is in uh, two dimensions that represent the three dimensional uh, structures of the head and neck. And as a result, we have different magnification between the structures on either side of the head. So we have a right condyle and a left condyle that are superimposed. Um, one is closer to the foam. The other is closer to the source of X-ray, etc. So we will have the the, the um, magnification issues and changes in both right and left structures. There is also displacement of structures vertically and horizontally, depending on their distance from the film and the head orientation. And also, the structures that are not in the mid sagittal plane are usually distorted. Landmark identification, it's a problem related uh, to locating the actual landmarks and understanding the definition of the landmark and the anatomical characteristics of the landmark. And usually it is related to the examiner's reliability, understanding of the anatomy of the, of the definitions of landmarks, the actual analysis used. We said that we have lots of types of analysis. Uh, that could be used. Each one has its own errors and, and, and uh, let's say, limitations. Uh, the method of registration and, of course, the circumstances of the whole procedure. Measurement errors is related to accumulative errors uh, uh, during the process of analyzing uh, the radiograph. Operative mistakes in using instruments and tools. So, for example, when you identify the point, you go for um, either a manual or digital, and then the use of a ruler or the use of a protractor. So, each time you do a certain process or a certain line, you draw it. There will be accumulative errors based on the on the whole process and the procedure. Uh, the more experienced the uh, examiner is the less errors we can uh, get more reliable the methodology will be. Now, in terms of uh, this is a paragraph taken from uh, Laura Mitchell uh, chapter. So in terms of 3D cephalometric analysis, since we're saying that this is this, the, the conventional cephalogram is a two dimensional representation of a three dimensional structure, then why not to use the 3D cephalometric analysis, yes, we have a copying CT scan uh, that is uh, becoming more widely used, actually. But, uh, and although it gives us more 
uh, potential benefits in terms of more accurate representation of the cranial facial structures, more detailed morphology for diagnosis and scope of, of growth monitoring and treatment plan, uh, planning and treatment progress monitoring as well. And three dimensions, looking at all the structures in, in, in full. Uh, but the actual uh, identification uh, of points, although it is very accurate because you can see it in three dimensions, but the actual uh, assessment and analysis that is available uh, is very limited. We don't have anything standardized to be used and to compare to. Uh, if we compare this with the cephalo, you know, the conventional cephalogram. Uh, so so far we can look, we can identify points, but the information is very limited. The use of this uh, 3D copy MCT scan is mainly mainly limited to the cases of uh, syndromes, syndromic cases, patients with a cleft lip and palate, patients with impacted canine, um, complicated facial symmetry, uh, sorry, asymmetry, and uh, cases of orthognathic surgery for planning, for to check progress, etc. These cases, it's the, 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 the 3D uh, community scan give us very valuable information. Uh, but for standard cases for orthodontic treatment, it's a, it's a too much uh, uh, radiograph to be to ask, you know, to to get the patient to have and exposed to such radiographs uh, radiation. So we don't need it really for every patient. Uh, only for very limited uh, cases where the 3D information is very valuable and could be used. Okay, since we talked about all the bits and pieces related to the cephalometry, we're going to talk about examples, how to apply our knowledge now to the different clinical cases. So we're going to start with Andrew. Andrew is a 12 years old male patient who presented with a severe class 2 division 2 malocclusion with, uh, in the late mixed dentition, as you can see in the upper right quadrant, we have a retained E. Uh, in the lower left quadrant, we have a retained C and a fully erupted 3, actually. And we have an E. Uh, and this is a normal uh, dental development to have the E at this stage. And is, well, it was lost soon after we took these um, uh, records. Uh, the patient also presented with a full unit class 2 molar and canine relationship on the right side, class 1 canine on the left side, with half unit class 2 molars on the left side. Overbite increased, over jet reduced on the centrals, increased on the laterals with the uh, complete overbite. So a radiograph was taken, and these are the pre treatment numbers for our patient. How can I use these numbers and translate these numbers into a meaningful clinical findings? So we take these numbers into our um, cephalometric report uh, table. And usually it includes the normal values, usually it's Eastman normal values, and then the standard deviations. And then we insert our patient values. So the gray uh, column here is uh, our patient, Andrew. And again, we have the normal value, standard deviation, and our patient's values. And we take each one, we look at each one, and we translate the meaning of these findings. So for example, is in A, for our patient is 76, which is less than the average. What does that mean? That means it is reduced, and this means that the maxilla is retrognathic in relation to the cranial base. So 76 is in A is uh, reduced, and this means that we have retrognathic maxilla. For the uh, SMB, for the mandible, our patient has 74, which is less than the normal value, even less take into consideration the standard deviation, which means that we have a retrognathic mandible. So both maxilla and mandible are retrognathic in relation to the cranial base, and we call this bimaxillary retrognathism. Bimaxillary retrognathism. Now the A and B is not written here because I have to calculate it, and A and B equals S in A minus S in B, which means 76 minus 74, and it equals 2. And if we convert this to the normal range, 2 to 4, that means 2 is normal. That means the patient has class 1 skeletal pattern. Class 1 skeletal pattern. 
Now we want to have the corrected A and B. We talked about Eastman correction, if you remember, and we have two conditions. The first one is to have the S in maxillary plane angle within average, and for our patient, it's 11, which means that it is within average. So since S in maxillary plane is average, so this is the first condition, and S in is not equal to 81, which is the second condition to be able to apply the Eastman correction. Now we can carry out the Eastman correction. How? Our patient is in A is 76, which is below 81, which is the normal by 5 degrees. So 81 minus 76 is 5 degrees. Divide by 2 equals 2 and a half. Our calculated A and B was 2. So 2, we add to it our corrected value, which is 2 and a half. 2 add to it 2 and a half equals 4 and a half. And A and B of four and a half is outside our average range. Not too much, it's a little bit increased. So the average is two to four, it's four and a half. But we still need to mention that this is considered mild class two skeletal pattern. So after correction, it's a mild class two skeletal pattern. Now, the maxilla medieval plane angle for our patient is 21. 21 is very much less uh, than the normal value, even if we took into consideration the standard deviation. 21 is reduced, which means that the patient has anterior growth rotation. The anterior lower facial height is also reduced. 51, 51 compared to 55 is reduced, which means that the patient has reduced lower facial height. The upper incisors to the maxillary plane is 98. The average or the normal is 109, which means that we have retroclined upper incisors. Lower incisors 78, which is again very much less than the normal, which is 93. So we call this a reduced lower reduced lower incisor to the plane angle, which means we have retroclined lower incisors. Both upper and lower incisors are retroclined, and this is typical in classical cases of class 2 division 2 malocclusion. Now the interincisal angle is 151, which is more than the normal. Why? because both upper and lower incisors are retroclined, and this is, we call this bimaxillary retroclination. Retroclination because the incisors, the incisors are retroclined, not retrognathism. Retrognathism, that means the bone is being positioned backward. So if the incisors are retroclined, both of them, we say bimaxillary retroclination. Okay, so to sum up, our patient is presented with a class 2 division 2 malocclusion, complicated with bimaxillary retrognathism, which means that the both maxilla and the mandible are retrognathic, with average A and B angle, uh, pointing to class 1 skeletal pattern, but after correction, it showed mild class 2 skeletal pattern. Uh, the patient has a tendency for anterior breath rotation with reduced lower facial height, both upper and lower incisors are retroclined, leading to an increased interincisal angle. So now these numbers are giving, our, giving us a clinical picture, more, more meaningful clinical information to be able to plan treatment for this patient. So as you can see, definitely we are trying to procline during treatment. We are aiming to procline the upper incisors to normalize, to normalize its angle, procline the lower incisors, reduce the overbite. Um, we cannot actually, for this patient, we cannot change growth uh, that much. And the class 2 skeletal pattern is mild, it's not that uh, severe, so it's not justifying using uh, growth modification and functional appliances. So we are aiming, the main aim is to go for uh, growth modification, extrusion of molars in order to improve the vertical proportions for the patient. So this is under during treatment. We're trying to distalize the molars to correct the full unit class two molars on this side mainly. Uh, fixed appliance treatment went really well. The patient ended up with a beautiful occlusion. And now we have the end, near end of treatment values. Okay, near end of treatment values. So I just want you to look at the change in the upper incisors. It was 98, retrocline, and now it's 110 which is almost average. And that means that it was proclined 12 degrees. The lower incisors was 78, 
and after near end of treatment at 89, which is almost average, with a proclination of 11 degrees, uh, the interincisal angle uh, uh, near end of treatment is 100. 60, sorry, before treatment was 161, and now it's 139, which means that it was reduced by 22 degrees. I think this number is um, uh, 159. I think this is wrong. This is 151. So sorry, 151, which is still, of course, increased, and it was uh, normalized after treatment. So these are the main changes during treatment. Let's take another case, Bavna. Babna is a young lady who presented with a class one malocclusion, and the main problem is severe crowding. She has beautiful skeletal pattern. She has beautiful um, uh, incisal classification, molar classification. The only problem was the severe crowding. So the uh, cephalometric values before treatment uh, were uh, recorded. And now we, we can take these numbers and insert them into our cephalometric table. And now we need to make sense out of them. So this, the SNA for our patient is 84. 84, if we take into consideration, it is increased, but if we take the standard deviation into consideration, that means we have slightly prognathic maxilla. So because this number is at the upper limit of normal. Okay, it's not within the average value, it's at the upper limit. So we consider this slightly prognatic maxilla. The mandible 81, 81 again is at the upper limit. So 81 means that we have a slightly prognatic mandible. And if we calculate the, S, the, the A and B, which is 84, take away 81 is 3. 3 is average, which means that we have class 1 skeletal pattern. The SN maxillary plane angle is 7, which is average, and the SNA for our patient is not 81, and now we can apply Eastman correction. Eastman correction means that how many degrees is the SNA for our patient is away from the normal. For our patient, it's 3. 3 divided by 2 is 1.5, and, and in, because it's more than the 81, then it's minus, because we need to deduct 3, take away 1.5 is 1.5. So corrected A and B is one and a half. What does it mean? As you can see, the normal is two to four. One and a half is less than two. Not a lot less than two, but it's slightly. So we say the patient is presented with mild class three skeletal pattern. Very mild, but it's there. The maximum deviation angle for our patient is 24. 24 is within average, taken into consideration the standard deviation. So the patient has average vertical proportions. Uh, sorry, average... Um, mandibular growth rotation. The anterior lower facial height for the patient is 51. 51 is reduced, which means that the patient has reduced lower facial height. The uh, upper incisors uh, is 106, which means that the upper incisors are of average inclination, but the lower incisors are 84, which is below the normal and below the standard deviation, which means that the patient has retroclined lower incisors. The interincisal angle is 147, a little bit increased, and it's mainly related to the retroclined lower incisors. Okay, so overall, the patient is presented with mild class 3 skeletal pattern after correction, um, and it's a combination of slightly prognatic maxilla, uh, and actually slightly prognatic mandible, but maybe mainly the maxilla. Um, uh, and also the patient is presented with uh, an average inclination of the upper incisors and um, vitroclined lower incisors. So mainly the patient was treated uh, using extraction. Okay, so extract, align the level. We tried to maintain everything except for the lower incisors. We did procline them because they were retroclined. Um, and this is the patient at the end of the treatment. Uh, with a beautiful occlusion again. And now we look at the changes uh, after treatment. And you can see that mainly, mainly the upper incisors were very slightly proclined, plus two, but it's the lower incisors that were proclined plus five, five degrees. Okay. Otherwise, everything else uh, was almost uh, maintained with an average. Because the main changes was in the alignment. We extracted four teeth, but we did, we did not. Uh, make lots of changes in terms of the anterior posterior position of the incisors, of the uh, other teeth we just aligned, and we use the space to align and level the teeth. Okay, 
Again, another example. This patient, you can see, uh, although it's not this radiograph was not taken properly, you can actually see that the patient had uh, his head tilted upward. This is not the natural head position. Uh, but anyway, the patient is presented with a class 2 division 1 malocclusion. And uh, the next step is to analyze the radiograph by identifying the points. So you can see the end point, uh, the nasian, the cella torsica, the lower border of the orbit, which is the orbitali, the porion. And then we have the anterior nasal spine, the posterior nasal spine, the A point, and the uh, upper incisors itch, upper incisal apex. And then we have the lower incisal edge to the lower incisal apex, and then the B point, Pogonian, Minton, Gonian. So these are the main points that we identified. Now we connect these points. So we have the blue line represent the cranial base. This red line represents the maxillary plane. Uh, the orange line represents the mandibular plane. And then we have the long axis of the upper incisors and the long axis of the lower incisors. And then we go for measurements. Now, what I'm showing you now is how to measure the angle between uh, the maxilla and the mandible. It's difficult to, to um, extend the line until they meet. So what do we do is to construct a line that is parallel to the maxillary plane, as you can see this line here. And then we can measure this angle because this line and this line are parallel. The same for the... Um, S N maxillary plane angle. So the S N maxillary plane angle, again, if you extend both lines, you have to extend it to too far in order for both lines to meet. So the easier way to do it is to get another line that represents the maxilla parallel to it, and it actually meets the S N plane, and you can actually measure this angle here, just to make it easy for you to go for measurements. We also construct two lines that are perpendicular to the maxillary plane one from the end point and one from the minton in order to uh, uh, continue with our measurements of the lower facial height, okay? So this represents the upper facial height and this is the lower facial height. And then we can actually measure the ratio of the lower facial height according to our formula that we talked about. This is the standard uh, uh, cephalometric uh, table. And now we insert the numbers that we had from this patient. As you can see, it's an 82 for the SNA, which means that we have a normal anterior posterior position of the maxilla. The mandible is 78, which again means that the mandible in the anterior posterior position is normal. A and B is 82, take away 78, which is 4. And this means the patient has class 1 clinical pattern. This in maxillary plane angle is 10, which means that we can. Um, apply Eastman correction if SNA for our patient is not 81, and it's actually the case. Uh, now, since both conditions were fulfilled, then we can carry out the Eastman correction. Eastman correction is 82, take away 81, which is one, and uh, divide by two is half. Then we take four, take away half is three and a half. Three and a half is still class one skeletal pattern. So even after correction, the patient is presented with a class one skeletal pattern. SN maxillary plane angle, sorry, maxillary mandibular plane angle 16. 16 means the patient has severe anterior growth rotation. This is uh, 11 degrees below the normal. 52.7 is a slightly reduced lower facial height. And uh, for the uh, upper incisors, 116 means that we have rock lined upper incisors. 92 is average lower incisor inclination. 137 is almost average into incisor angle. And of course, from the radiograph, we could guess that this is a class 2 division 1 incisors classification. If we look at the lower incisor edge and its relation to the single and plateau of the upper incisors, and the overjet was increased and the overbite was increased as well. So all these information we can actually take from the radiograph. And after that, we can um, aid our uh, prognosis, uh, uh, sorry, diagnosis of the case and treatment planning taking into consideration this report. Another case, um, and this is our last case, uh, as an example uh, for cephalometric uh, analysis. As you can see, we have this patient here. Uh, we start by identifying the points. So we have the Anesian, 
the Latartica, uh, inferior orbitali, porion, anterior nasal spine, posterior nasal spine, A point, and then the upper incisal, apex, upper incisal itch, lower incisal, apex, lower incisal itch, B point, pogonian, minton, gonian. Okay, after we identify these points, we go for our planes and lines. So as you can see, this line here represents the cranial base, which is the SN line. And then we have this line that represents the Frankfurt plane from the porion to the uh, inferior orbitali. And this, this line represents the, up, the maxillary plane, uh, which is the posterior nasal spine, anterior nasal spine. And this line from the Vincent to the Gonian is the mandibular plane. And to, uh, to make it easy for you to measure the SN maxillary plane angle and the maxillary medieval plane angle, we uh, take, uh, let's say we multiply uh, the maxillary plane into two lines, one to meet with the SN and one to meet with the medieval plane, uh, just to make it easy for you to measure. So we measure this angle here and we measure this angle here. And uh, again, we construct uh, two lines for the anterior lower facial height measurements. One that is perpendicular to the maxillary plane from the nasion, and one perpendicular to the maxillary plane from the minton in order to carry out our measurements. Now we fill uh, our patient's numbers into the table and we make a sense out of it. It's in A77, which means that the maxilla is retrognathic because this is reduced. 77 for the mandible is considered average, so we have normal mandibular position for our patient. 77 take away 77 is zero. Zero for the A and B means that the patient is presented with a class three skeletal pattern. And SN maxillary plane angle of 12 means that we cannot apply Eastman correction. So here we call, we, we write down not applicable. We cannot measure, uh, we cannot correct the A and B, okay, because this is above the average. A 32 value for our maxillary medullary angle means that we have a posterior growth rotation. A 56 means that we have average lower facial height. 116 for the upper incisors means that we have rock lined upper incisors. 90 for the lower incisor is average, slightly retroclined, but if we take into consideration the standard deviation, this is considered average inclination. 129 is a result of a uh, very much proclined upper incisors. Okay, so these are the main findings for this patient. If one, if we want to continue with the dental relationship, if we want to add more information other than the upper incisor inclination, the lower incisor inclination, and the inter incisor angle, from the radiograph we can see that the incisors are almost edge to edge, which means that we have class three skeletal pattern with reduced overjet and reduced overbite. Okay. So these are the main findings that we can uh, get out of the uh, cephalogram. So this topic was covered in uh, three lectures, um, and uh, this will be very important for uh, your fourth year lab exercise and later on during your fifth year exercises, uh, because you are required to take um, uh, to take the uh, cephalogram that is given to you and start analyzing the cephalogram by identifying the points, drawing the lines and right measurements. And then after that, you have to deliver a proper cephalometric report. I hope these exercises will help you uh, with your tasks. Um, and uh, thank you for listening.